Have you seen the videos of the, uh, the Tom Cruise deep fakes? Uh, look on my timeline if you haven't seen them yet. Um, they're, I don't even know what to think about them. So there's some discussion about whether they're real deep fakes. They're actually so good that you can't tell if they're deep fakes. How do, why do we call this a simply a, a virus pandemic when it's clearly an obesity pandemic at the same time? It's two pandemics, if you call obesity a pandemic. But we sort of ignore one of them and pay all of our attention to the other one when they're clearly both gigantic variables. Besides obesity, the other biggest factor is how many strangers you let in your house. And by strangers, I mean anybody who doesn't live there normally. Uh, Bill Gates was asked about nuclear power, and he said it absolutely will be politically acceptable again, which is an interesting way to make the prediction. Have you seen the videos of the, uh, the Tom Cruise deep fakes? Uh, look on my timeline if you haven't seen them yet. Um, they're, I don't even know what to think about them. So there's some discussion about whether they're real deep fakes. They're actually so good that you can't tell if they're deep fakes. And some people are saying, ah, you got fooled. It's really just a, a look-alike. It's a look-alike pretending to be a deep fake. Maybe. Maybe. I can't tell. I can't tell if it's a real person. I also can't tell if it's actually Tom Cruise who's playing the prank. (laughs) It doesn't quite look like Tom Cruise to me. So my personal opinion is it's not Tom Cruise. I can't rule out a look-alike. But it did look a lot like him. Now, uh, somebody says too tall. I don't know if you can tell from the video, his height. But... Here's the thing. That's how good a deep fake is right now, that we can't even tell if it was really a deep fake. How good do you think the best ones are? Because this is just something that ran on Twitter, right? It's just something on social media. How is the best one? <laughs> Don't you assume that there are government, I mean, let's say government versions of this, you know, where we're, we're working on it for both offensive and defensive reasons. Because I have to think these deep fakes have a military application that's through the roof. What would happen, and you know we're working on this, right? Like I, I don't feel like I'm giving away a state secret because it's kind of obvious. Don't you think that our government, and probably other ones, are putting together deep fakes of other leaders? and deep fakes of uh, terrorists. Don't you think if we had a good deep fake of uh, Osama bin Laden, we could have gotten, we could have made some videos and put them into the system and caused people to act differently because they thought bin Laden was giving them guidance? I bet we could. <laughs> and I'm not sure we didn't. How would we know, right? We wouldn't know if we had done that. Nobody would tell you. So the, the uh, opportunity for um, weaponizing these deep fakes is really scary because imagine you get into a shooting war and we take the, the, a deep fake of the leader of the other side, put him on a video, and he says, hey, everybody, lay down your weapons. We're surrendering. His own military would probably think it was true, right? Because everybody, would, you know, even in the military, they have the phones, right? Or do they? If you're on operation, maybe not, because you could track the phone. But uh, when they got back to base, people would have phones and stuff, right? So even, even if you're a terrorist, you would see the video. It wouldn't have to be on TV. It would just be circulating. And it would be your leader, your terrorist leader, saying, uh, lay down your weapons. You know, we got everything we wanted, or whatever. So that's coming. I've come to a... Uh, Potential decision about what's the biggest factor or factors in COVID infections. And it goes like this. 
I feel as if there are two things, and some of this is just speculation and a little bit of what I'm reading. But uh, here are some things we've learned about the COVID infections, we think. Number one, in the UK, surprisingly, they say there's no real difference in minority outcomes for coronavirus, except that they get infected more often. But haven't we all been under the impression that your uh, genetic makeup would probably make a difference in your outcome? But it might be that that's true, but that genetic difference is not necessarily uh, ethnically related. In other words, if you read between the lines here, the UK outcome, if, let's say, the data holds, you know, any preliminary study like this, you can't, you can't assume it's right, but let's say it is. It would be saying that genetically there wouldn't be much difference across ethnicities, but there might be a big difference in terms of lifestyle and economic situation, and that might be what's driving more infections. For example, at the lower economic end of things, there might be more people living per house. It could, it could be that. It could be they have less uh, health care resources. could be that. So this, this, uh, this may be really important information if it's true. I'd still wait to get a confirmation of this. All right, so that's the first new piece of information. There might not be that much difference ethnically, even though the outcomes are very different. It might be lifestyle, not genetics. Although there could still be, and probably is, a gigantic genetic difference across individuals, but not necessarily across ethnicities. Um, Which seems unlikely to me, frankly, but doesn't it seem unlikely to you that there's no difference in ethnicity? Feels unlikely, but that's that's what we have here. All right, um, then we also have an HSE University research study that says that, uh, oh, I'm sorry, that was, that was the genetic difference study. But there's an additional study that says that uh, 63% of U.S. hospitalizations for COVID could have been prevented if we were not so darn fat. So obesity, according to this one study, is responsible for 30% of the excess hospitalizations um, in the same sentence, it says 63%, so it's, it's written very poorly. So I don't know uh, exactly which of those numbers to look at, because it looks like it's two different numbers saying the same thing. But there's a gigantic difference in obesity. Now, we all knew that, right? We all knew that. But there's some kind of word that I didn't write down that says that uh, sometimes it's the combination of two things. You know, you need the, you need the comorbidity plus the virus. One by itself doesn't doesn't kill you. Now, how do, why do we call this a, simply a, a virus pandemic when it's clearly an obesity pandemic at the same time? It's two pandemics, if you call obesity a pandemic. But we sort of ignore one of them and pay all of our attention to the other one when they're clearly both gigantic variables. Now, I agree the virus itself is a bigger variable than obesity, but the obesity thing is so big, it's like you should talk about them in the same sentence every time. We've got a big problem with the virus killing our fat people. Now, I don't do fat shaming, so I'm just using fat in a casual way, not to mean an insult. Uh, You know, I I myself have been... uh, a few pounds overweight at various times in my life, and so I don't do fat shaming. But it's just simply a fact that Americans are uh, overweight. So I feel as if the fact that we don't talk about that more is for what? Social reasons? Wokeness? Is there some reason we can't talk about people's health because they'll feel bad? It'll be racist somehow? Sure. I feel like, besides obesity, the other biggest factor is how many strangers you let in your house. And by strangers, I mean anybody who doesn't live there normally. So, uh, I feel as if, if we controlled one variable, we would get through the pandemic quickly. 
Now, maybe the vaccinations will, will get us there on time anyway. But if in the beginning we had only done one, one restriction, I think we'd already be done. And that one restriction would be don't let anybody inside your residence who is not a resident. Unless, you know, it could be the plumber with a mask, right? But nobody to visit. Not even your Anantown family members. I feel as though that one restriction of nobody in your residence except the residence for a month, and we'd, be, we'd be pretty well done, I feel like. Now, you wouldn't get rid of the infection, but you might get it down to a low level. Now, does anybody disagree with that? Because it's something like over 50% of infections, it's worse in the winter when you're indoors. Somebody says, I thought we did that. No, we didn't really do that. We, we, we said, don't, you know, you don't want to socially mingle, but I don't think anybody took it seriously inside their own house. I think everybody lets their other family members, I think everybody lets the boyfriend or the girlfriend come over. I feel like inside the house there are no rules, and that probably, that was the main problem. Probably the main problem. And I would also think that you could solve that with statistics and publicity. If you, if you stop somebody on the street and said to them, what's the main place you get infected? <clears throat> what would the average person say? Think about it. Uh, you're probably way more informed than the average consumer, just the fact you're watching a, you know, a live stream about the world and politics. The average person isn't really paying attention to too much news on average. So stop the average person in the street and say to them, where do you think most infections happen? What would they say? I'll bet they wouldn't say home. I'll bet most people would say, well, they close the restaurants and gyms. It's probably restaurants and gyms. Or they might say, must be the workplace, because why else would they do the lockdown? But I'll bet it's not. I'll bet if you simply produced enough statistics to say, look, most of it is because you're letting somebody in your little uh, unair-circulated space who doesn't live there. That's, that's most of it. I think if we just just hammered, out, hammered people with, uh, I don't know what the real number is, but it's like 56% uh, is in the home, and just keep telling people that. Say, uh, it's because the, you, know, you used your, uh, your app and, on Tinder, right, or whatever it is. CNBC had this story, and I think it's important that it's CNBC because it's a major, major network, right? Uh, Bill Gates was asked about nuclear power, and he said it absolutely will be politically acceptable again, which is an interesting way to make the prediction. I think he was asked that specific question. But according to Bill Gates, who most of you would associate with the left, wouldn't you? Now, I don't think he associates himself that way. I doubt, well, I mean, maybe he's a Democrat, I don't know. But he seems more like a problem solver than a political animal. And he's saying as clearly as possible, nuclear power will absolutely be politically acceptable again. And he, said, he points out that it's safer than oil, coal, and natural gas. The reason it will be acceptable is that it's safer. And then he goes on to talk about one of the companies he's invested in, Terra Power. It's a, the Generation 4 nuclear power that can't, can't melt down, and it's smaller, more economical. It's more off-the-shelf pieces. You can transport it easily, etc. So the, we may be years away from making that commercial, but it really does matter that Bill Gates said this, because he's... He has credibility with the left. You know, he thinks climate change is a big problem, so he's got credibility. 